Okay, glad to have all of you here. If you'll open your Bibles with me back to the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. That is where we are going to get kicked off here. In just a few moments, we are in week number 10 of our study of the life and times of Jesus Christ. We're glad that you have joined us. And we are, uh, there are a couple of parallel accounts. We might reference something from Matthew's account or Mark's account. Uh, There's a lot of overlap, but we're going to be walking uh, primarily this morning together in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. We're glad that you're here and we will get started in just a moment. But before we do, if you will bow with me, let's start off our day together with a word of prayer. Our great and awesome Heavenly Father, we bow before you on this beautiful first day of the week. And we are in awe of your power and your magnificence and your love for us. Help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear the wonder of creation around us. Great is your faithfulness in the changing of the seasons and the rising of the sun and in so many different ways. We praise you for that and we thank you for that. And we especially offer our thanksgiving this morning for this opportunity to dedicate this new week to you, to dedicate this new day to you, to focus our hearts and our lives on your glory. Help us to realize that that is the reason for everything, your glory. Help us to live in harmony with that. Help us to soak in your communication to us in your word. Help us to be inspired and and provoked by that this morning. We thank you for our free access to your word and we pray that more the world over would enjoy this access that we have and, and we pray for open doors of opportunity to continue to share this good news of your Son. We pray that you would be with us throughout this day that you would be magnified and that we would be encouraged and provoked to love and good works and that this would be a, a great springboard so that we might live in ways this week that make you look great. Thank you so much for the gift of your Son that has made all of this possible. Thank you for the opportunity to be adopted into your family. And it is through Jesus Christ, our elder brother, that we offer our prayer this morning. Amen. Okay, Luke chapter 5 is where we are getting kicked off this morning. Luke chapter 5 and verse 1. Little bit of an overlap from something that we had talked about a couple of weeks ago in connection with Jesus and the calling of some fishermen. The scene again is the Sea of Galilee. We have camped here now for the last couple of weeks right along with Jesus where He uses the northernmost shore of the Sea of Galilee as a kind of base of operations for the spread of the kingdom. You look back where we were in Luke 4, uh, verse 42. Last paragraph of uh, Luke chapter 4 kind of sets uh, us back in that scene. When it was day, Jesus departed went into a desolate place and the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was, Luke tells us, preaching in the synagogues of Judea. On one occasion... Chapter 5 and verse 1. While the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, another interchangeable term for the Sea of Galilee. He's there on the shore. The view from uh, up on the shore over onto the sea, you can just 
see a, a small section of the Sea of Galilee. Talked to you earlier about how things get built up everywhere they can build in that part of the world. This is an Orthodox chapel uh, just outside of ancient Capernaum, right there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. You head a little uh, to the east of that, and, and it's a beautiful landscape were it not for the power lines. <laughs> but you, you, you continue heading a, a little east, and you can see, again, our setting. Beautiful, beautiful setting there in the Sea of Galilee. And here is Jesus standing there. Verse 2, He saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. It's been a long night. Fishermen would fish through the night on the Sea of Galilee. And now it's, it's daytime. It's been a long night. It's the last things that they have to do to wrap everything up to get some rest and recharge for the next night. Here they are washing their nets and getting into one of the boats, which was... Simon's. He asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Kind of a, uh, a little bit of uh, modern trivia, uh, a fascinating thing that you can see in modern Israel, modern Capernaum today. Back in 1986, two brothers, two fishermen, still on the Sea of Galilee today, uh, in uh, the months before that, there was quite a drought in northern Israel, and so the level of the Sea of Galilee had gone way, way down, and where usually there would be water, there was nothing but mud. Two fishermen doing very much the same kind of thing that people have been doing there for thousands of years stumble across something that gets them pretty excited and to make a very, very, very long story short, they found there in the mud where usually there was water an ancient, ancient boat. And you can uh, chalk whatever you want up to science, but supposedly according to carbon dating and all sorts of tests, this is roughly 18, 1900, 2000 years old, somewhere around there. An ancient boat that was preserved very, very nicely uh, right there in the mud. That's what it would have looked like 2,000 years ago. Okay, and even today uh, they, they have these replicas that they will take you out in. So here is Jesus in a boat something like this. Boat belongs to Simon and he tells Simon in verse 4, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answers, Master, okay, remember, it's been about a year since Simon first ran across Jesus, all the way back in what we have as John chapter 1. There's been some interaction here. There hasn't been a whole lot of public teaching of Jesus, but there has been a, a, a great deal of interaction with Jesus and these first followers. Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but I mean, you think about Simon. Simon, for a living, is on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, for a living, his father was a, a carpenter, right? Easy for Simon to reason, would it not be, you know, why don't you leave the fishing to the fishermen kind of thing? Uh, you're from Nazareth. You didn't grow up on the Sea of Galilee. I did. James and John and Andrew did, and, and uh, you know, it's been a long night and we're tired. But to Simon's credit, he says in the latter part of verse 5, At your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat, maybe James and John. Remember, we've, we've kind of got those two pair. We've got Peter and Andrew, his brother, and then we've got James and John who had been there together before. They signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. 
But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed them. Let's think back to where we have been so far. Amazing things that Jesus has been able to do, to do so far. What have we run across in the Gospels? First one, water to wine, right? From John's Gospel to the west of where they were in the city of Cana. There was water to wine. What else? Yeah, there was healing of an official's son in John chapter 4. There was last week that man with an unclean spirit who was healed right there in the synagogue after that, whose mother-in-law was healed. Peter's, Peter's mother-in-law, okay? And then uh, Mark records for us in Mark chapter 1 that that evening the whole town is outside of, of that house and everybody is bringing people who are sick or oppressed by unclean spirits and Jesus is healing them. Okay, so lots has gone on already. And so why do you think Peter responds the way that he does? Jesus is able to do this. It means, obviously, pretty good financial payout, we would think, for Simon Peter. But it goes deeper than, Lord, thank you for all of these fish that we can take to the market. First thing that he does in verse 8 is fall down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Why say that kind of thing? Chuck? I asked that same question. Okay. It didn't make sense to me. And even while you were reading it, I'm still puzzling it. Yeah. This month, amount of time has gone by, and he's witnessed these things. Why now? Does he have this reaction? And the only thing that I can come up with, reflecting back on my personal life a little bit, throwing it on Peter, he's seen these miracles that Jesus can do for others. Yeah. The, the wine, the, the healing of somebody else's son, the <coughs> casting out the demons of this guy, and he's watching. All of a sudden, he is the recipient of a personal yeah. benefit, a miracle from Jesus Christ. And guilt that he has in himself. I'm not worthy of this. Yeah. And I can feel that, you know, welling up in my voice and falling down. I'm not worthy of, of this. Go away. You know. Good thoughts. Gordon, go ahead. Yeah, when I read that, I'm reminded of Isaiah in the sixth chapter, I believe. Yeah. That's where he said, woe is me, for I am undone. Yeah. He just realized he's in the very presence of deity, the Perfect deity. Okay, absolutely. As he gets that special revelation of God in the temple. And he was comparing himself to deity. There is no comparison. Yeah. Dave, go ahead. Jason, I was just going to say, you know, uh, Peter can reflect back when he wrote the first Peter to, to things like this. Yeah. He, he says there in first Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 25, he's talking about Jesus and he talks about him as one who committed no sin, nor was guile found in his mouth. <clears throat> but Peter recognized quickly, I think here, that, I mean, he doubted the Lord. Yeah. And, I mean, he, he was a sinful man. Yeah. And he, he, was not, he was not worthy to be in his presence. He was just, you know, uh, humbled uh, by the Lord. Yeah. I think it was... Uh, you know, those kinds of experiences that, you know, looking back, uh, Peter offers some great insights and wisdom for us about, you know, faith and doubt. Yeah. He wasn't one of the Pharisees, wasn't ex uh, an expert in the law. He wasn't a scribe. He wasn't one of the Sadducees. He was an ordinary guy. And ordinary guys were the same 2,000 years ago as ordinary guys are today. They weren't perfect. Peter knew his faults and I think as we put all of this together 
when he sees this done in his boat right there in front of him and, and there are personal ramifications it has a profound impact and it causes him to look at himself you know this Jesus is not like my brother Andrew he's not like James and John my my fishing partners and as I continue to think about who he is that forces me to look in the mirror and say I'm not even worthy to be in the same boat as you I'm not worthy to be on this same shore of the Sea of Galilee as you and you keep hanging around and if I keep living the way that I'm living that's going to make me uncomfortable Ed you had your hands raised go ahead yeah um I guess just to build on that a little bit, Jesus doesn't announce that he's going to work a miracle yeah. before he does these things. You know, so he steps in there and, and tells Peter to, to launch his boat out and cast out his net. Well, Peter, you know, the first thing he says, we've been fishing all night and haven't caught anything. You know? yeah. so he's not thinking that anything special is going to happen here. Yeah. You know, obviously, he, but he says, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. Yeah. You know, so then it is... It does catch you, might think, kind of flat-footed if you... By surprise, yeah. Alan, go ahead. Jason also is not only funny being an ordinary guy, he had a wife, but he had a mother-in-law. Yeah. Yeah. And like, like Chuck has brought out, I mean, he has seen things impact the lives of other people, even as close as his own mother-in-law. But this takes him by surprise. No doubt about it. And uh, something is clicking here. In, in Peter's mind. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. I can use you. Okay, and we talked a little bit about that a couple of weeks ago, how Jesus could use these fishermen. And uh, I think the, the point that Dave brought out is, is especially uh, a, a good one, big picture wise. When you go back and you read First and Second Peter, don't just read that as, well, this is black and white text detached from any sort of a context. This had an author, okay? This man that we're reading about wrote that years later, okay? When you go back and you read 1 John 1, and John introduces this by saying, that which we have seen and heard and, and we touched for ourselves and, and we saw these things for ourselves, well, think about who's writing that, okay? That's John, who's right here in the thick of all of this. And as you read those things from First and Second Peter and First and Second and Third John and, and Jude as the brother of the Lord, you read those in light of this history, it just deepens our understanding altogether, okay? Let's keep reading in Luke chapter 5. That's the first thing that we run across. Luke 5 and verse 12, verse 12. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And you and I have a tough time really grasping, I think, what that's like. Um, I'm going to take like five seconds here. I'm going to show a picture. If you're squeamish, if you don't want to see a person with leprosy, this is not. Uh, this is just leprosy that he's got on his toes. So close your eyes or look somewhere else if you don't want to see that kind of thing. But what we're talking about here, uh, I forgot the fish. We'll talk about that. That's not the fish. That's not the fish. We were talking about fish. I, I forgot about that. I wanted to show you. Even today... <laughs> <laughs> even today, you can open your eyes. <laughs> even today, you, you can get uh, served what they call Peter fish today, okay? And uh, when we were there several years ago, uh, they'll give you the option there in, in modern Capernaum to eat fresh fish pulled right out of the Sea of Galilee. You got two options, fish and chicken. I went for the fish, Shelley went for the chicken. But, uh, you, you know, even today, this is the kind of fish that gets pulled out of there. Okay, back to the leprosy. What we're talking about here in Luke chapter 5 and verse 12, we don't deal with that a lot today. This is a picture of a man in, in uh, modern Africa uh, who just uh, on his lower extremities is suffering from leprosy. Horrible, horrible disease, uh, a flesh 
eating disease that will just cause your extremities to rot and eventually uh, fall off. And very, very, very common 2,000 years ago in this part of the world. Okay, And lepers would be outcasts. They would have to be away from society. If anyone came near them, they were responsible by Jewish law to cry out, unclean, unclean, stay away, okay? They would wrap themselves in white clothing and, uh, and they were responsible to stay away. And obviously, you put yourself back here, you're going to stay away from the villages of lepers and if you run across someone like that, what is the very last thing you're going to do? Touch them, right? I mean... In modern day terms, I mean, that would be like someone who has AIDS and they have an open cut and they're just bleeding all over the place and you've got a cut and you're bleeding all over the place and you just go and rub, rub elbows with them, okay? In our minds, that, that would just be extraordinarily foolish. You don't do that kind of thing 2,000 years ago, okay? So while Jesus is in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy not just on his feet full and when he saw Jesus he fell on his face and begged him and somehow the reputation has spread we've talked about how it starts small Jesus even gives us that parable that we're going to study later on that the kingdom of heaven is like the smallest of seeds just like a mustard seed and it's going to start out very very small and the vast majority of people aren't going to even know that it's growing or it's like a little bit of leaven in a big lump of dough and it's going to work silently and slowly but it's going to grow and grow and grow and that's how his reputation is in the region of Galilee. This man, one way or another, has heard about Jesus. He refers to Him as Lord and he begs Him, if you will, you can make me clean. Some measure of faith, right? I mean, obviously the man is desperate. But he gives this great statement of faith. And what do we know about Jesus as he looks at this man? He knows the condition of, of his heart. That's been emphasized already a couple of times in these early chapters of the Gospels. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. And you can imagine if you're Peter or Andrew or James or John or one of these other guys how you would feel about that because I mean it's they've been blown away but the more we read we're going to find that you know it just rocks their world and then they kind of settle back and then their world gets rocked again and then they'll kind of settle back and and it's just this big cycle with them and so we can imagine what they're thinking about as they see him touch him and Jesus says I will be clean and immediately the leprosy left him and here's our pattern. We've talked about it before. He charged him to tell no one. But go, show yourself to the priest as was required in the law of Moses. Leviticus chapter 14 tells us a little bit about that. Make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for proof to them. But now, Luke tells us, even more the report about him went abroad Great crowds gathered together to hear Him. Okay? Remember, we've talked a lot about the purpose of miracles. And this is just one more verification. Jesus will do an extraordinary thing. He will tell the person, don't make a big deal about this. There are a few who are in intensive training for three years. They see what's going on. But that makes sense because they are the ones who are going to be given the Great Commission, right? And so it starts small, but more and more and more the reputation spreads. And as people come, they hear Jesus is able to do amazing things. And what door does that open up? The teaching door, right? 
great crowds come to him and they gather to hear him and he heals their infirmities. But corresponding with what we talked about last week, he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Okay, that's the second one. Third one in Luke 5. Verse 17, on one of those days as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. He's gathering a crowd, but it's not just of the common Galileans, right? There are people who are coming from villages, and the further we get along, the more we're going to note they're being sent from Jerusalem to try and figure out what's going on. Because, you know, great rabbis of the day, well, they're kind of Jerusalem-centered. And they've got a certain reputation in Jerusalem. They were educated at the feet of men like Gamaliel in Jerusalem, the way Saul of Tarsus was. But here is this rogue rabbi, and when he comes to Jerusalem, what does he do? Well, he turns over tables, and he makes a whip, and clears money changers out of the temple, and then he leaves. And uh, obviously, the, the questions are, are flying as to who is this. So lawyers, teachers of the law are sitting there, those who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And Jesus is able still to do amazing things. The power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But here is, again, how urgently people want to get to him. There's no way to get through the door. Okay, You're carrying a man who is paralyzed, and there is no way that you're going to get through this crowd. Maybe you've been in a crowd like that before, where sometimes you can kind of snake your way through, but there are certain crowds where if there's something up there that they want to see, you're not going to get through, much less four of you carrying a guy who can't walk. And so what do they do? They get up on the roof and tear the roof off. And lower the man down. Okay? And verse 20, when Jesus saw their faith. He says, man, your sins are forgiven you. Now, if there is one thing that Jesus can say to get the Pharisees and the teachers of the law attention, this is certainly one of those things. I mean, why does Jesus say that kind of thing? Is it not because of who's there? I mean, we haven't run across this kind of statement yet, but we haven't run across Jesus being urgently, anxiously watched by Pharisees and teachers of the law. And so, again, this statement has a context. Here are people who know the law, and for someone to say that kind of thing, according to the law, what is that? That's blasphemy. Because who is the only being who can forgive sins? God. Pharisees can't forgive sins. Sadducees can't. Scribes can't. Experts in the law can't do that. No, in their estimation, it's here's the law with its 430 commands. You do that and then you'll be justified in the sight of God. Okay. Here is a man lowered down. His friends have faith. Jesus sees the faith of these men and he addresses this man. As far as we know, there hadn't been any dialogue between the two of them. And he says, your sins are forgiven. And it's as if Jesus has just grabbed on to the, the lightning rod of the Pharisees. The scribes, verse 21, the Pharisees began to question saying, Who is this who speaks Blasphemies. Who can forgive sin but God alone? And you almost get the idea, you know, there's this big crowd and Jesus is over here and the Pharisees and scribes are over here because it says Jesus perceiving their thoughts. Okay, it's not like Jesus should be able to hear what they're saying, but he answers them. Why do you question in your hearts? 
Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk. But that you may know. Okay, why did Jesus do this? Sure, the guy is suddenly able to walk. Okay, and that's, that's, a, that's a good benefit from what's going on here. But why? Even deeper than that. Why does Jesus say what He says? And why does He do what He does in that house? Well, Luke tells us. Jesus tells us. So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He turns to the man and says, get up. Now, if Jesus turns to the man and says, get up, and the man doesn't get up, what happens? You know... Suddenly now, all the momentum that is slowly building has has been blown up, right? It's no more. But again, it goes back to the purpose of miracles, okay? And and we're going to see this over and over and over again. Why does Jesus do this? It is an incredible opportunity to bring the Pharisees right in front of the mirror of God's will and say, listen, You need to pay attention to the things that I'm saying. And just so you know you need to pay attention, get up and walk. He he starts with a provocative statement that gets their attention. And then to prove that they need to listen, he tells the man, get up. And he gets up. Now, for a Pharisee-like Nicodemus what does that do that just deepens his faith right but for Pharisees who are not imminently concerned with God and his glory and his will but it's more about I'm going to take this system of religion and I'm going to use that in whatever way I see fit and use it in ways that will benefit me when it's not God centered but it's me centered he's threatening what I have and that makes me mad you see how twisted that is how, how darkened in understanding, how, how choked the hearts are that this wouldn't blow your mind and say, wow, I need to do whatever this guy is saying and I need to change whatever he tells me to change. No, it's he's threatening what I have and I don't care what he's able to do I'm going to do whatever I have to do to keep him from threatening me. That's not a relationship with God. That's using a form of religion for my own personal gain. And that kind of thing hasn't died out. Dave, go ahead. Jason, I was just going to say in verse 24, yeah. he makes reference to the Son of Man. And to the, to the Pharisees, those that were educated in the law, they would know that that... You know, has reference back to the Old Testament. Yeah. And, uh, you know, talking about the Son of Man as, you know, uh, the Messiah. Yeah. And uh, so so uh, he makes that reference and he demonstrates that he is that one through this miracle. Yeah. And uh, that he, he, he does have that power to forgive sins. Not only to heal all these people, but the power to forgive too. Yeah. And that's, the, we see the escalation of it, right? First, He's just the son of a carpenter. Then he's a rabbi. Then he is a prophet in the eyes of that woman in John chapter 4. Then he is the son of man. He is the deliverer. And then above all, he is the son of God. But you see how this thing is, is ramping up. Verse 25, immediately that man rose up. Again, paying attention to the language of these Gospels, it, it's, it's remarkable how often miracle, Jesus says something and they use the word immediately. Okay? Again, somewhat different from a lot of the things that we see uh, today. 
so-called miracles. Immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all and they glorified God and were filled with all saying, we have seen extraordinary things. Okay? The rest of the chapter talks about Jesus calling a tax collector named Levi. Tax collectors, kind of like the social lepers to the Jews. You don't have dealings with tax collectors. They're turncoats, right? They are Jews. They live in Jerusalem, but they've been contracted by Rome to take taxes from their brethren for Rome. And Rome tells them the way you're going to be supported is you take a little bit extra from what we're demanding. You know, if we're demanding 10%, you figure out how you want to live. Take 15%, you get 5. Take 20%, you take 10. And uh, it's not hard to imagine then how Jews would feel about these tax collectors. Jesus is just adding to this inner circle. He calls Matthew. To Matthew's credit, he gets up and follows him. He invites him into his house. He has a great feast. And there's a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table. And again, here are Pharisees and scribes grumbling, and we've got a teaching opportunity that Jesus takes advantage of. He illustrates there at the very end of the chapter the inappropriateness of fasting for His disciples at that point of time. You know, there's this question, John's disciples, they fast, and here are your disciples, and you're attending feasts, and they're not, they're not fasting. And Jesus says, well, you know, Wedding guests don't fast while the bridegroom is with them. And you don't take a, a, a piece of a new garment and put it on an old garment. That would be inappropriate. Or you don't put new wine into old brittle wineskins that are about to burst. Now is the time to rejoice and to soak all of this in. The time is coming when the bridegroom will be gone. Maybe the first instance where Jesus gives us just a little glimpse into the dark future. But for right now, he says, it is time to rejoice, time to listen, time to soak all of this in because the bridegroom is here. And what is the bridegroom doing while he is here? Look at verse 31. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, in the minds of the Pharisees and the scribes, what called people to repentance? It was the law of Moses, right? This is different. This is revolutionary, okay? And we're going to continue to see that over and over and over again. Thank you for being here. Lord willing, next week we will be in John 5. Week 11 in your material will be in John chapter 5. Thank you.